All right, well, as I said, we are here today to talk formative webinars and focus strictly on middle school. So welcome middle school teachers if you are here. Um, let's do a little bit of housekeeping first. So my name is Jill Whalen. I am a senior client success manager here at Formative, but I've also been in the classroom. So I was a classroom teacher of 18 years and that varied in classroom settings. So I was a uh, high school science teacher, primarily life sciences. I was a high school ed tech coach. I was a middle school science teacher. And I also spent over a decade in K through 12 teacher preparation programs at colleges and universities in New York, um, teaching you know the very best to be the best teachers that they can be. I am a proud dog mama, and I live here um, on the East Coast in Buffalo, New York. So thank you so much for joining me to talk about all things middle school today. A little bit about our agenda today. So we're gonna focus first on student engagement. We're gonna talk a lot about our new teacher pace mode. How do you engage students in synchronous learning? We're gonna move on from there to talk about anti-cheating tools. So how do you kind of, as we get to wandering eye, um, for students that are just maybe challenging the system a little bit, right? And we love that about our students that at this age, they start to be a little bit more exploratory and think outside of the box. Um, we're going to try and um, mitigate some of those outside of the box cheating tools uh, so that we, do, we have them use their outside of the box thinking elsewhere for maybe the content areas. And then finally, we're going to focus on feedback loops and how do we keep feedback relevant? How do we provide real time feedback and really present a dialogue with our students in real time so that we can both assist them, but also guide them in the future to um, maybe more of a summative assessment. We're going to focus first on student engagement. So let's have you go, if you have a device, if you have another window open, um, please log into formative.com. Once you log on formative.com, you're gonna hit the login button, you're gonna enter your credentials. Once you've done so, I'd like you to enter this quick code. This is going to introduce us and start us off today with our teacher pace mode. So if you enter the code 8, U as umbrella, 8, Q as in quilt, L is in lion and C is in cat. That's going to take us to our teacher pace mode. Now, this is what it looks like on your laptop or your desktop. If you're using your phone right now, it's gonna look very similar. You're gonna log in and then you're going to do the join, join with code. Same code, 8U8QLC. But let's go into this formative. So this formative is going to be delivered through teacher pace mode. If you're familiar with formative in the past, you're familiar more with how formative normally has been acting. So I would refer to that more as a student paced mode. So what I mean by that is when you give a formative to students, now you might set a time limit, you might set a open and close date, right? But really students have the ability to pace themselves. So if they want to spend five minutes on the first question and two minutes on the second, they can do that. They are moving at their own pace. Teacher pace mode is something we introduced in the fall. We're very excited about it. It's more for synchronous learning. So that can be synchronous face-to-face -face in the classroom setting, but it can also be synchronous face-to-face -face if you're using Zoom or Microsoft Teams or Google Meets, whatever platform you're using, as long as you're together in real time. So think about teacher pace mode as a way for you to build a formative, but build it in a way that it's a mini lesson. So it has maybe notes built into it. Maybe it has a video built into it. So it's a one-stop shop for you to deliver a lesson, but then it also has checking for understanding questions built into it as well. And these checking for understanding questions are going to be paced at your, your own um, mode, right? So teacher pace mode. So if you don't want to have that question that we all, if you've been a teacher for one day, you know this, right? You have a student, everybody's on question four, and then a student raises their hand and says, but I have a question on, on question eight. We're not on question eight, right? We've all been there. This is only opening up to the students, the questions or the content that you want them to see in that very moment. So everyone is on the same page at the same time, which again is why it's synchronous learning. So how do I do this? So what you're looking at right now is kind of the teacher view. So I'm ready to start my teacher pace mode. 
The students have this at their, it's been pushed out to them too, but I haven't started it yet. So they can work on their devices. We're face to face, but they're going to see this on their device too. I'm going to hit start. I get a nice little countdown there. And the first thing that displays are my instructions because that's the first part of my formative. The students, and you should see this if you use the join code, see nothing else but what I have on my screen right here. So a great way to kind of say, okay, this is going to teach you about teacher paced mode. Now I can move forward and we see all of kind of, I'd like to say kind of like their slides, all of my slides for my mini lesson, I can go to next and I can move in order. Or if I need to, I can jump around by just clicking on whatever area I want to go to. But let's just go to next and see what happens. So when I click next as a teacher, the next piece displays to students. So again, here's my objective. What a great way, right? You don't have to write objectives on the board anymore. You can build them right into your formative. They're already there. You're displaying for the students. Now you can stop and have a discussion about this. Who knows about the Pythagorean theorem? Have you ever heard of this term before? Um, who knows what a right triangle is? You can start having these interactive discussions. So although they're seeing this on their device, when they're with you, you know, Zoom to Zoom, Teams to Teams, or class face to face, they're also allowing for discussion with your students. So as we continue through this lesson, and I encourage you to actually answer this question now, I can build in checking for understanding, right? What do you notice? What do you wonder? Feel free to, on your device right now, type this information in. And I'm gonna show you how that I can also bring this up in real time. So what I see here is I have what I've displaying as a teacher, right? Maybe I have this on my tablet, but I can also display what students are answering here, right? I've hidden names, so no one is being exposed, but I can comment on these throughout the class. This is a great place for us to have discussions. So I can say, Oh, awesome. I see someone says they see three squares off each side. That's a great, that's a great observation. Perfect. What else are you noticing? Type in your answers. And so we can have these discussions. You can see, right? Here's one coming in right now. I see every single letter you're typing as it's coming in, as you're erasing, as you're making changes. So, right. Three different size squares. That's another great, the sum of two. Oh, I like where you're going with that. Keep your thought up. I think that's a really good thought, what you're thinking. Um, great, the sum of two smaller squares. And what about that? You can have this dialogue back and forth with your students. Now, let's say that I notice some things that are being said here and it's, it's alarming me because we talked about this before. This is more kind of introductory review. I can click this pause button over here. That's going to freeze your ability to respond, right? This is great to say, okay, eyes on me. I see a lot of answers coming in, or I hear a lot of chit chat within the room as you're entering in your wonders and your noticing um, components. You can pause right here to say, okay, let's stop. Let's go back to what's our objective today, or what are the notes that I just displayed? And then you can unpause and you can go back to that initial wonder and response. And students can continue to start answering their questions. So, I, so it's a great way to really kind of control the room, but also get some great data real time that you can see. Again, if I want to go to the next one, I just go. Here's a great example. I just have notes here. So if we look here, right? I just have some notes. I don't have anything, but it's good conversation to have with your students. Maybe they're taking notes as well, or maybe I'm just talking about this with them. Now, this is a great way to do the I do, we do, you do. So if I keep moving forward, now I'm giving them some simulation. I'm gonna maybe give them five, 10 minutes to kind of manipulate this, move it around, see what they can do with it. Um, and then maybe together, we're going to work on these problems. I can continue to go through this. We can do some show your work. We can talk about maybe some more showing your work. What's the hypo hypotenuse, find that. But then one of the great things is I can build in a you do piece. So now it's a student's turn, but I wanna make sure that my students have enough time to work at their own pace like they were before. So if I go up to this end session, I can actually switch from teacher pace mode now to student pace mode. And when I do that, I've ended my teacher pace mode. 
But students and you, if you've, been, if you've um, joined us, you also now have the ability to finish those questions at your own pace. Take two minutes per question, take five minutes per question. You can work at your own pace now. I can always go back and I can restart this teacher pace mode as well at any point in time, and then I can pick up where I left off. So that's teacher pace mode. That's a great way to engage your students. And again, show the data with names hidden, of course, so that you actually can have conversations about this. You know how, how and when you need to stop, move back or move forward. All right, so that is student engagement. Let's move into actual formative and let's talk about some anti-cheating features that we have in the system. So I'm gonna do this by building a formative. So I'm gonna go over to new formative if you're unfamiliar with how to build a formative in here. I'm just gonna, going to title it middle school webinar. Since that's what we are working on today. And I am going to start by clicking this blue and white plus button. And that's going to give me my question type. So I'm gonna talk about three question types on how to kind of minimize the wandering eye. So I'm gonna start with a multiple choice question. I, let's say I'm doing kind of a social studies lesson on government. So checks and balances. So multiple choice, multiple choice is great because it's one of our question types where you can actually auto have the system auto grade for you. So I'm gonna put in four responses here, right? So um, some maybe tricking students, right? Checks and balances, they might think checks, maybe something to do with payment. Although I don't know how many of our students even know what a check is this day, right? We're all using electronic payment so often. So I can click the correct answer. System's gonna auto grade it for me, but that's not the anti-cheating piece that I wanna show you. First of all, randomize. You can randomize the options here. So every single time someone takes a formative, right? This is going to randomize. And I can see what that looks like if I come over to the eyeball here for the student preview. I can preview it as a phone, as a tablet or as a laptop. I'm gonna do the tablet so I can kind of see both sides of it. But you can see that based on how my answers are set up here, they are not displaying the same way here. They have been randomized. So if you have students that are sitting in close proximity, have the wandering eye, you can kind of lip, um, mitigate this a little bit um, by doing the randomizing the answer choices. Let's do another one with the categorizing. So categorizing. So let's say we have a Spanish class, right? So um, let's say place the um, words in the correct category. All right. Let's be grammatically correct. Oh my goodness. Let's be grammatically correct here in, in proper nouns. So if you haven't set up a categorized question, it's very simple. So we have categories over here. So I am going to have my nouns category. I'm going to have a verbs category, and then I can add more. Two is what puts there is put there to begin with, but I'm gonna also add an ad adjectives category. And then my items over here are going to be what I want them to put underneath each of these. So let me just pull some, so I'm just gonna do a couple here. So we'll do this word. We'll do this Spanish word. And you, again, we're given two items, but I can click as many items and add those as I want. Now categorize, you can also do auto grade. So I'm gonna show you how to do that real quick before I show you kind of the anti-cheating tool. All you have to do is take the word, drag it into where it belongs. And now you have created an answer create key so that the system will grade it for you. But in terms of anti-cheating, again, we can randomize the order. This is going to mix up all these words. Also, students, here's where students can start to think outside of the box and how can I trick the system? If I leave this on right now as is, as long as they get one of these correct, they're going to get full credit. But I don't want that. I want that to be more representative of their actual knowledge. So if I turn on allow partial credit, if students get the noun right, they'll get credit. But if they get the verb and adjective mixed up, they're going to lose credit. So it's going to give you a score for that student that is much more realistic of their actual knowledge base. It's going to prevent students from just putting things everywhere and being like, well, I know from the past, if I just put the right noun there, I'm going to get full credit. It doesn't matter where I put everything else. 
So we're mitigating that a little bit by allowing partial credit. So if they get something correct, they get points. If they get something incorrect, they get points decreased. So it kind of keeps adding and subtracting for the whole question. Let's do one more and let's do a multiple selection. So multiple selection, right? So maybe we have a math. So in math, I know in middle school, sometimes we're starting to work on scientific notation a little bit. So I'm gonna put in some scientific notation and some that are not. I want students to identify what's the scientific notation, what is not scientific notation, but because it's a multiple select, multiple answers are correct. Okay, so one of the things if you're unfamiliar, so here, right, 10 to the eighth power. If I just highlight the eighth, I get this option here. I can do a superscript up here. I can also do subscripts. Um, I'm going to do the same thing down here and do this. So again, multiple select, you can auto grade that. Um, it's boxes instead of circles, like within the multiple choice. Boxes just means there are multiple options. So I'm going to click the correct answers. Like before, I'm going to randomize my order so that these get jumbled up for my students. And I'm also going to allow partial credit so that if they get this one correct, but then they get this one incorrect, it's going to give them points, but take some points away as well. All right, let's move into some assigned settings for mitigating some cheating. When you select a class, I highly encourage you to select the optional settings. They're not optional, look at them, they're really important. So one of the ways you can help with cheating, in middle school, you tend to have multiple sections of the same content area, right, throughout the day maybe over a two-day period if you're doing a block schedule. What you can do is you can click right here, schedule open and close times. You can select the day and time you want this to open for this particular class. You can select the close time as well. This is going to help prevent other sections or classes from seeing this before they should. Um, another thing too is you can sit after submissions, right? You can um, make hidden. That's going to prevent students from going back in and seeing the formative once they've actually submitted it. Now, one of the other things is you can display questions in random order. And you might be thinking, well, we just did that, right? But when I toggle this on, this is going to shuffle all of my questions, not just my responses for question one, my responses for question two. This means that maybe some students will get the multiple choice as the first option. Some might get it as the middle question. Some might get it as the third question that we did. So it's gonna randomize everything. Now. If you want to do this, um, you have the ability to also do this in your settings as well. So this is more an entire formative. You have to have the premium version. So you can randomize your options for any basic version or premium account, right? But if you want to randomize all the questions in a formative, you have to have the premium um, account settings. You can also come up here to, it might be your image, it might be your initials, it might be your avatar. But if you go to settings over here, you will see if we scroll down, you have display questions in random order. If I toggle this on, this means that every formative I create is going to shuffle my questions every time. So it prevents me, I shouldn't say prevent, it, it doesn't make me have to take the extra time to always randomize and click that button every single time I assign a formative. From now on, as long as I save changes, my formative is going to automatically randomize the questions throughout. So that's another premium feature if you want to do that all the time. Now, if you have one formative here or there that you don't want to do, you of course can always turn it off, but this is going to help prevent you from having to do this all of the time and waste your time. Formative saves auto all the time, except for about three different areas. This is one of those settings. Make sure you save changes if you change anything within your settings. All right. Now let's move on to our last focus today and that's feedback loops of how do we provide feedback and engage with our students on formative. Um, one of the ways we can do that, and I'm gonna bring up a sample formative here. Oh, before I do that, I forgot this one. Another anti-cheating. Um, this is again for premium, but let's say I have a student here to explain the Pythagorean theorem, right? That's the theme of the day apparently. Um, this little exclamation point is showing me that this was a copy and pasted response. I'm gonna click on April's work. It's gonna bring it up over here. Again, it tells me, exclamation point, this response includes copy and pasted parts. Okay, I'm okay with that because 
Maybe I don't know what she copied and pasted. So I can take a look at this and say, oh, okay. But if I hit this details button, this is going to tell me exactly what April copied and pasted throughout answering the question. So these first two pieces, I see April just used LaTeX, right? So she was maybe trying to put in the formula for Pythagorean theorem, but was using LaTeX. So she was grabbing it from maybe a, a LaTeX tool on the internet and putting it in. I'm okay with that as a teacher, right? Maybe I'm Spanish, there's accents, they're copy and pasting, that's fine. But then the third copy and paste here we see is April's entire answer. This might be okay as well. It might be something that April copy and pasted from her own work. Maybe she wrote something else and it just copied and pasted it in here. But it does give me pause to look at this and say, okay, let me read this. What's the writing style? Does it sound like it's from a scholar article? Does it sound like it's from Wikipedia? Do I want to copy and paste this myself and throw it into Google and see if it sticks and I see if it, it was copy and pasted from an, a, an internet site? It doesn't tell you exactly if it was a student copying it from their own work or from the internet, but it does alarm you to take a closer look. So this is another kind of anti-cheating um, tool that's built into formative. And again, you're going to see that exclamation point. You can click on the student's work. And then if you click details, it will show you every piece of pasted text that that student did for that particular question. Now let's move into feedback. So providing feedback for students. So let's take a look at another formative. And here's a formative where I gave it an assignment. It was an annotated assignment. Read this expert from George Washington Carver. Highlight in your favorite color what is the, the main idea. So I have all of this work here, right? So maybe I want to provide feedback. What I can do is I can click on the student's work. Again, it's going to bring the student's work up here. But you see I have this feedback tool. So I can actually draw feedback for this student. I can click on here. It's going to bring up the student's work. Now I have the same tools that the students have when they have this. I can change color. So maybe I want to do orange. Um, maybe I want to use the scribble tool because I want to draw attention to something over here. Um, I can underline. I can do arrows. I can do anything that I want. I have shapes if it's related or, or relatable for whatever you're drawing. Um, if I needed to add another image, I could do that or another document to support my feedback. I could do that. Math keyboard is not very relevant in this case, right? But if I was a teacher and I was doing something math grading, I could use this as well. I can always erase my feedback um, as well. And then I can add more things back into it if I need to, if I, if I mess something up. When I'm done with my feedback, I simply hit this blue check mark to kind of lock it in. Then when I can send feedback either now or when the assignment closes, We'll see there is my feedback down at the bottom. If I send this feedback right now, now I have the student's work. We can click on it and there is mine. I have not changed the student's work. You can see their original work is right here. I have just provided yet another kind of example and to say I've taken a, a, a plastic sheet of paper, put it on top or plastic written on top of the plastic so that I'm not messing up with the student's work, but I am drawing attention to different areas. Now, one of the other pieces of feedback that you can do is you can come in here and you can see feedback in real time, right? So as I was seeing feedback when we were doing teacher pace mode, same thing here. So if I see a student here, maybe, you know, they put a frowny face, I can actually click on the student and right now I can send them a message and say, you know, maybe I want to say, why are you feeling so anxious about this? And we can start having this private discussion. I don't have to ask the student in front of other students or whisper it, which still draws attention to from other students. But I can send this, why are you feeling so anxious? The student can then type back to me, um, you know, that I was, I was absent the past two days and I'm really confused, I feel really lost. So I can provide some more feedback and one-on-one -on -one attention to that student without drawing that student, drawing attention to that student in the class for others. So we talked about a lot of different things in a short amount of time. We talked about student engagement, using the teacher pace mode. How is that helpful in synchronous learning so that you can track progress, have those discussions, but then unveil questions and stop questions as students are answering them. We talked about ways to anti-cheating tools and to helping students not trick the system and get away, get around that. And then we talked about feedback loops and 
the importance of providing feedback, whether it's drawing feedback or providing feedback in real time. So you can elicit those discussions with students so that you actually have that communication without drawing attention to the student in the class. Or if they're fearful of raising their hand, you can still engage them um, privately. So we have about four minutes left. Um, please, if you have any questions, put those questions in the chat. If you don't, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we hope that you learned a little bit about middle school and formative and how you can actually try and do a little better and more improved formatives with your class and get them more engaged and, and help get you the data that you need. Um, Katie has put in the chat, if you haven't seen this, to reserve your certificate of attendance, please fill out the survey. So if you have not filled out the survey, please do so before you exit the um, meeting so that you do get that certificate of attendance or whatever um, you might need that for at the, the school or district level. We'll stay on um, for the next three minutes, but again, feel free to put any chat in there. Please answer the survey so you get credit. Um, and once you're done, have a great day. I hope the rest of your school year continues to be as, as good as hopefully the first part of it was. Thank you so much for joining us all today. Bye-bye.